on, everybody? It's episode 36 of Collider Heroes. I'm John Schnepp, and we're going to talk about superheroes, supervillains, television shows, movies. As always, with me is John Campio. What's up, John? How are you doing, everybody? We can talk about Snoke today. We are I not. I feel like everybody, that's all they want to talk about. We are not about, talking about, about no today. Star Wars, Force Awakens, <laughs> no Snoke, no Jedi, no Force powers, no ma magic stuff that has anything to do with Star Wars. We love Star Wars, but this is time to get sweaty about superheroes. And with us, a very special guest this week is. Adi Shankar, you might know him as the executive producer of the film Dread, the short the short film Punisher Dirty Laundry and Power Ranger. He also was the executive producer for The Gray, starring Liam Neeson and Joe Carnahan. Awesome film. Adi, I thank you so much for being here as a special guest. Thank thanks, you for coming, man. Thanks for, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, man. So, yeah. Like, like, what are you, like 21, 22? Like, you've done 30. like five? No, no, no. I, you've I, done... You've done so many movies. Like, be, like I'm like, how old can this kid be? And look at all this stuff he did. Like you were, you were saying earlier. Like, how old were you when you were actually executive producing Dread? Like 24, 25. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. So, like, you know, hats well, off. You to know, you. I just kept waiting for the adults in the room to be like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> get out of here. Oh, I'm no. like, what? but it became one of those things. You know what I mean? Like, like, um, It's like doing something once entitles you to being able to do it again. Mm -hmm. So it just, <laughs> it just kept just going. Keep the domino and, and no one ever like kind of tapped me on the shoulder. Well, and was like, we're glad you keep um, doing these things. And, and then I think, um, I think it was like three years ago. I finally like for completely had a full on meltdown, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I was just sitting there panicking and keeping it. Um, and Thomas Jane happened to be there. He's like, "Hey, pal, uh, what's the matter?" I'm like, I'm like. Dude, I, I feel like a complete fraud. I'm gonna get found out. Like I'm totally fucked, bro. <laughs> and he's like, you know, I kind of feel that way too. <laughs> and then I was, and I, then I just started like calling people and, and be like, hey, do you feel like this this way too? And I realized like, oh man, it's it's an actual thing. Like everyone kind of feels like a fraud. And I felt like marginally better, only slightly though. All right. <laughs> well, we're here but, yeah, to tell you you're not a fraud. To the entertainment business. Yeah. Well, I still, I, I like you, you know, I still, I'm still waiting for like the old white guy to kind of. Hey, don't God. make it see, about white see, that's guys. What I, I, Come on. I, I made it about race. Yeah, and like, I'm now the, it's going to be like... Now suddenly I'm the old white guy. All right, I see what you're about, Shankar. Everybody now knows Sean Snep is Oh, oh my gosh. Hey, yeah, I, oh. I'm com coming down on you guys for your superhero weirdness stuff. Let's yeah, move on yeah, to no, our first it's, topic. It's just hard. No, we're glad that you're doing what you're doing. Really? Man. Yes. You don't, you don't call me Emo Night Shyamalan secretly when I, I, when I, I, I don't. I've me. never heard that. I have you never, never heard that. I, no. I, I honestly, I never heard that. But now that you say it, it's fucking catchy, and I just might once in a while. But I'll do it in love. Emo night, I'll do it in total love. <laughs> I like the reason that you wear the makeup. When I when I met you a couple weeks ago, I asked you. You told me this story. Yeah, this tell is a us good story. why that you wear this makeup. You, you, why don't you say it? You say it. I like it because I said so. So what's up with the crow look? And he said, "Well, I don't want people to ask me about my race, so I'd I'd rather ask, they ask me why do I have this makeup on my eyes." Mm -hmm. And that I thought is that such was such an awesome answer. It's, it was awesome, and I was like instantly liked you. Like, like I didn't. I already liked. He, did, you, he like, came in the office. And says, "I got to tell you this cool story." And he yeah. told me this story. I said, "That is awesome." I thought it was fantastic. You know what else is fantastic? Our very first topic of the show. Let's get into it. We're talking about Spider Man, Ant Man, Black Panther, and Civil War news. We got Anthony Russo. He's off at a convention in Brazil, talking about Spider Man, saying he's always been a part of the Captain America Civil War storyline, and that they cast the young Tom Holland to be the age appropriate high schooler that Peter Parker is in this new incarnation. Spider-Man and Ant-Man enter the movie later and bring the laughs while Black Panther enters the film pretty early on, is central to the story, and never picks a side like all the other characters actually do. John, let's start off with you. What do you think about the Russo just busting out and talking about all the different story aspects of Civil War? What strikes you? Well, with the Black Panther part, we kind of knew this already because we heard them talking about, we covered this on Movie Talk a few days ago where he said, he was talking about the character and saying that the producers were and saying, you know, he's never really on one guy's side, never really on the other guy's side. If you just look at the trailer, it looks like he's fighting Captain America. So right. I'm sure he does at some point. So that led us to believe, oh, he's on Iron Man's side. But I guess he never really does choose a side. But once again, these comics just kind of affirm what we've been suspecting for a long time. spider mans going to be in the film but he's going to play a relatively small role. Might be an important role. Remember, you can have a, a tiny, tiny role in the film and still have it be a massively important role. This whole stuff about them saying he was always in the movie. Nonsense. I, I don't know that I buy that. That's, that's total BS. Because if you were, if you were planning, and here's the thing, if, if you were the Russos and you were planning on having him in the film the whole time, and you knew right from the beginning you were planning on it, Lock, Stock, and Barrel, why is Spider-Man such a small part in the movie? Right. Like, I, I have a feeling, I still firmly believe that 
Black Panther is our substitute for Spider-Man, uh, kind of playing the Spider-Man role, if you will, as it was in the comic books in here. And then they realized they got Spider-Man and they wrote a part for him near the end. He'll have some comedic whatever. Mm -hmm. He'll show up, get people excited for the next Sony movie about it. But um, And I love the Russos. I totally love the Russos. And I totally believe when they said, when they were first thinking about it, they maybe had Spider-Man in their, in their brain, but I can't believe that they wrote out their full script, mm -hmm. had a Spider-Man character in it that they weren't even going to use. So I find that a little questionable. Adi, what do you think? Well, on the Spider-Man issue? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's no way. I mean, come on. Like, these things are planned, like, years in advance, right? Like, they're... If Spider, if the Amazing Spider-Man series hadn't been so bad, there we go. I just shot him. Like now, Sony's no, don't worry. Not work. Now, <laughs> no, now don't worry. I'll, I'll take me. it for you. I hate the Amazing Spider-Man too. It's garbage. I actually no, thought they were continue. very well done. I um, hated them. <laughs> I, I, you know, I thought they were I very well done. I love the first one. Didn't like yeah. Mark, so much. If Mark Webb ever wants to work with me as a as an actor, I, I'm totally <laughs> down. Um, but yeah, those movies were. were um, if, if Amazing Spider-Man two had hadn't been a disaster. I don't think Spider-Man would even be in Civil War. Period. Mm -hmm. Oh, right? totally changed. The so game. it would have been yeah. a it, it would have been a substitute. That's yeah. like, um. So there's no way it was like a, an advanced planning thing. Um, I don't know necessarily if it's Black Panther playing that role, right? Because Black Panther, because remember in the comic books, Spider-Man was really in in the Civil War comic right. books. Right. Spider-Man was like kind of the, the the little kid, and he was like. It, 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 it was the uh, the ultimate. You watch the cartoon, yep. Ultimate Spider-Man. It's kind of like that version of Spider-Man, yeah. where he's a kid and he's like, "Oh my God, I get to hang out with Tony Stark." Right. And um, they kind of like they're like they're basically like the Hollywood producers versus talking to like the young starlets <laughs> back in the fifties. Like, come here, kid, I'll turn you into a star. Yeah. Just tell everyone who your what your real name is. Yeah. Like, you, that whole vibe. Um, you know. So, I, yeah. I read into it. I read into what the Russos were talking about as saying, look, remember when the Amazing Spider-Man 2 was in production and they had talked about maybe having uh, the Stark Tower, the Avengers Tower, actually in the background. And there was they were actually had a, that model and they were talking about doing it. So that led me to believe that maybe they were talking with Sony about having the Andrew Garfield version of Spider-Man make a cameo in the Avengers, similar to why the Hulk can't have his own standalone, standalone movie, yet can be in the Avengers. It's a similar kind of rights issue. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm, my guess is that maybe there's some way that they could still possibly make a deal with Sony back then. When The Amazing Spider-Man 2 came out and didn't financially bomb, but it was a critical bomb, and people were just like not liking it. I just so. don't like Spider-Man as a character anymore, you know? Um, cause comic books end up being this very progressive thing, at least historically they have been, right? Mm -hmm. Where, um, the popular comic books of that time period end up reflecting what, what's going on in, in society sure, at, right. at any given point, right? Um, case in point, Professor X is basically Martin Luther King, um, Magneto, Magneto is, is Malcolm, Malcolm X, X right? right? Civil rights issues, right? Um, like Iron Man was like this D-list character that really no one cared about because he didn't he didn't make sense. But in today's world, where we're all fame fame obsessed, and the tech finally makes sense, like you know we're 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 tech and fame obsessed. Iron Man ends up being like this perfect character, right? In that, uh, it, in the zeitgeist of today, right? And Tony Stark is Iron Man, right? So like, there's no secret. Spider Man either. ends up being this like boring character that almost ends up being this throwback to an, an <clears throat> like another era. You know, he's mm -hmm. um. He's too clean cut. He's he's too, um, he he's like literally the opposite of an antihero. He he will do <laughs> he will do the right thing to a fault. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons I think I appreciated the Andrew Garfield, uh, at least in the first Amazing Spider-Man film, was because the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. We talked about this before. I felt like the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man was very much a throwback to the 60s Peter Parker, yeah, the, the cut, clean cut, cut from that, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff, whereas at least I felt like in the second Spider-Man, going to your thing about the Tony Stark Tower, I had always interpreted that, the idea of the Avengers Tower being in the background, kind of like Christopher Nolan in the last, in The Dark Knight Rises, when at the end you find out that uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt's real first name is Robin. To me, which he did not look. Christopher Nolan came out and said that was in Nolan's own words. That was just a tip of the cap to the fans throwing the name in there. He was not saying this was the comic book Robin at mm, all. Right. And I kind of get a feeling 
that the tower being in there was just an agreement between Sony and Marvel. It was like, this is going to be our tip of the cap of the fans. Just like, remember that one time Hugh Jackman was going to be in one of the Marvel films just as a bystander, just kind of walking by in the background? Mm. They were never close to a deal with Fox of any kind, but it was just kind of a tip of the cap. That's how I was interpreted, but the way you explain it totally makes sense, too. So I could see it being... Could have been the inner workings. We don't know, but... uh you know, we'll find out very very soon. I, I like the way that they're integrating Black Panther into the storyline. It sounds yeah, like too. Wakanda will be the opening scene, and whatever mm-hmm. happens there will force this kind of superhero registration act. You yeah, know? And, and earlier when I was talking about, you know, the, the Black Panther not really being a substitute for Spider-Man. Right. It's because, you know, Black... The characters are so different. They really are. Yeah, they like, really they're, are. they're literally night and day for right. each other. Yeah. Like, literally, one's like a leader, one's like a little kid. Yeah. yeah. It's like, no, it's true. That's why both of them can fit into this film, and I don't think they're going to fight like, oh, this one should have been that character. I think the Sp- the Spider-Man that we'll see in this film is a little kid. He's 16. He's in high school. You know, I, I, I think the only real, like... I think the Marvel Universe would really benefit. I'm, I'm actually, you know, um, really glad that the X-Men don't exist in the Marvel Universe because, you know, if, if you're a fan of comic books from the 90s, mm-hmm. you know that, like, Marvel stopped being Marvel and just became X-Men and Friends. Yeah. Um, yeah every, and Wolverine movie, was in everything. After, after yeah. the movies, yeah. it became Wolverine and Friends. Yes. It's like, it's like Wolverine and the Avengers, Wolverine yeah. and blank, Wolverine yeah. and, you know... Um, yeah, I'm very um, happy that they exist in separate universes too, because right. we get more movies as well. They're fighting each other, and we, you know, um, it doesn't make any sense because, like, you're like, okay, well, why is um, Captain America treated okay, but mutants are not? Like, make up your mind here, you know, <laughs> like, right? Um, it, it never that was that was always this logical inconsistency for me with within the Marvel universe mm-hmm. because you have. People who are who have superpowers and they're heroes, but then you have people with superpowers and they're born with them and they're right. considered mutants and they're like, no, 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 no you're you're bad, you're bad. Well, right. I think they're going to try to absorb some of that flavor with the Inhumans, like putting yeah, the Inhumans them are going to be the new X Men yeah. for for Marvel since mm-hmm. Marvel realizes they're never getting the X Men back. Yeah, that's they're creating their own new X Men yeah. in the Marvel. But I the love Inhumans. the Inhumans. Bring on Karnak. All right, next subject: Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice trailer number two came out. The second full-length trailer for Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice dropped last Wednesday on the Kimmel Show. That guy gets everything, which features dialogue between yeah, why Bruce does he Wayne. Get everything? I don't know. Does, <laughs> does that, that piss you guys off? As uh, a, just slightly. As a, uh, you know, as a, as a, as right? an outlet. As yeah. an outlet. Doesn't no, that, that piss no, no, not at all. Bother, it's yeah. Jimmy Kimmel. He gets everybody. Everybody's on that show. It's just weird that he actually literally gets. Everything. I think he's premiering Star Wars: The Force Awakens tonight. He's going to show the entire Star Wars. That's just Jimmy Kimmel. He can do. He can get away with that. So, all right, so Dawn of Justice. We got Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne talking to each other. We got lots and lots of Lex Luthor, a lot of corny Lex Luthor lines. We got a teenage ninja abomination coming in, scraping it up with the Batman and Superman. So it's officially revealed that the Nightmare Batman, it's been official now, everyone's talking about this, the scene of him chained up with Superman coming in, pulling the mask off, and then you see all those weird parademons flying around, the little fly creatures. You got a grim, silent Superman. That's all a, actually a, a nightmare that Bruce Wayne is having in the movie, so that's been officially, now it's official. I was th- saying it might be part of the movie. I remember John and a bunch of other people saying, no, it's, it's a dream sequence. It is a dream sequence, so I'm bummed about that. Speaking of the two guys who are always really angry with each other, they are subsequently revealed to be pals by the end of the trailer, fighting side by side with Wonder Woman right before the now useless, somewhat deflated title appears called Batman versus Superman. They show them all friends. So... My opinion on that new trailer is they showed way too much. I think they could have cut out that last 20 minutes. I think, once again, it's kind of... 20 seconds? Yeah, sorry. 20 minutes, I think. Yeah, 20 (laughs) seconds. That was a hell of a trailer. It's a really long trailer, guys. Um, Yeah, those last 20 seconds, I feel like by showing Batman and Superman talking with each other as kind of pals, is she with you? I thought she was with you. That humor... And then also showing Wonder Woman, you look, we're guessing that they're fighting Doomsday, like, you know, with the power of cutting things, you don't know who they're fighting, but it's pretty much you're guessing that, or whatever the creature is called, what a lot of people, fan speculation is saying it's the Wraith, this creature yeah, that yep. is a, sci- like, you know, DNA, Z- Zod kind of thing. It makes sense why he's got the same powers as Superman, but let's just get back to the... The trailer itself, I feel like by losing those last 20 seconds and maybe not showing so much or saving some of that Lex Luthor humor and putting that at the very end, like a lot of fans have recut that trailer. I've seen like four different versions so far. All of them are superior to the actual trailer that came out because it just takes like logic to like, don't do this, do that. And that's what I wish they did. So that's my opinion. How about you, Adi? 
I'm with you. You know, I, I think uh, <clears throat> it, with all movie, with all marketing, less is more, right? Yep. Like, um, there's a reason when everyone like loved Apple. They wouldn't be like, here, here's the new phone. Here are the 12 new features in the phone. By the way, it comes in 12, you know, it, right. it, it's just less is more. It's just save some of that mystery. Right. Um, I, I think that's why, um, I mean, Star Wars comes out in what, like a few weeks? Go uh, like less one than week. seven days, <laughs> seven okay. or eight days. Right. Everyone in the world is going to see that. No one knows what it's about. Right. It literally, the, the trailers play out like extended music videos, right? Yeah, in many ways, um, yeah. Like this movie, Batman versus Superman. If you if you've read any team up, any versus comic book ever, they always have the same plot, right? It's like Thor and uh, Green Lantern. They meet. They there's some sort of misunderstanding. They fight for a little bit, yep. and then ultimately they ultimately team up the they, they team up to fight. You know, the bad guy or or, or whatever it is, right? right. It's it's a, it's a formula that's almost been run to the ground where it's become a a cliche, sure, right? right? Um, the problem with that scene you described is I love it. I thought it was great. I know where the movie's going. I can literally plot it out for you. Yeah. Yeah, and that was ultimately the problem that I think a lot of... You see, some people would follow me, who follow me on Twitter, wrote to me, it's like, uh, why why are you so upset about Doomsday showing up? It's like, no, 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 you misunderstand. I don't have a problem with the Wraith or Doomsday or whatever the monster that Lex Luthor unleashed shows up. Right. I, don't, I don't mind that. I, I'm not a big fan of the look of him, but that's not the problem. The problem was the movie's called Batman v Superman. That's the name of the movie. And you showed the resolution. Now, you're right. That formula has been followed all the time. And nobody on this earth was expecting anything different. We all knew that by the end of this movie, going Dawn of Justice, moving into Justice League, they will have a resolution and they'll be fighting side by side. We know that. But that just because we know that doesn't mean you show it to us. Mm -hmm. You know, you're building up the first trailer that they showed at Comic-Con is still as much of a Star Wars fanatic as I am and Star Wars is life to me is still my favorite trailer of the year. More than really? Civil War, hmm. more than the Star Wars trailer. I love that one at a Comic-Con so much. was incredible because it built up Batman v Superman. And then in this trailer, the last 20 seconds, you just undid it all. I didn't mind the Lex Luthor humor as long as they show it's a duplicitous Lex Luthor, like behind cold door, closed doors, he's a cold-blooded killer. No, not killer, but cold-blooded, ruthless. Right. But in his public persona is this happy girl. I'm fine with all of right. that. But you're right. When you show the resolution, even if we know it's coming, you don't show it to us. All they had to do was take that out, and it still would have been an inferior trailer to the first one, but a good trailer. Because I, I think we all we like the first I, part of that trailer. I wasn't trailer, buying right? Lex Luthor either. A yeah. lot of people are feeling the same Me neither. way. Me neither. I really did not like, I, uh, like Jesse Eisenberg's portrayal of him. It's a corny. Yeah. But what if what I'm suggesting is, is the case where he's pulling a Bruce Wayne, where Bruce Wayne in the Batcave is a totally different dude from Bruce Wayne at the party holding champagne. So what if like Lex Luthor, the true Lex Luthor we see in the movie, is very much more along the lines of the Lex Luthor we expect? I would want to believe that, but they show that Lex Luthor like behind That's closed true. doors, like yeah. doing his goofy, dumb, like, I'm from Jim Carrey from the Riddler, you know, like just <laughs> overacting, like what movie are you in that these other guys aren't in that you're in the same scenes with? You know, it's like that kind of... I'm fearful of the tone that, like, you know, I haven't seen the film, so may, I don't want to judge it or too harshly from the, the like the three scenes that Jesse Eisenberg was in. But I'll say this: that one scene from the first Batman v Superman was that the red capes are coming. The red, that bugged me. Did it? Yeah, it bugged I, me. I like that. It bugged it. me because it just it hinted at overacting to me. I was like, I, I, I smell overacting from this guy, but I'll let it lie because I haven't seen it. And then I saw all those like, oh, I wouldn't want to fight that guy. <laughs> like some sprout wings and float away. You know, I, you know, <laughs> what do you what do you think, Adi? Trailer. I don't know, man. Like. It's just so homogenous, too. You know what I mean? It's like. I don't know. It, it it just kind of hints at kind of like this. The, 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 it's got shades of like white power in there to me as a as a non white dude, and I'm I, and I and I know I talk about this to to death, but mm -hmm. just kind of as a as a minority, right? Who who feels underrepresented in in entertainment in general, right? I, I don't. There was never a point in my life where I was sitting there watching something, going like, "Oh my god, that's me on on screen." It's always like. 
okay, that guy's clearly not like me. And and this movie's like kind of the poster child for it at sure. this point. A lot of white people. It's a lot of white people yeah. just in a, in a room like deciding, deciding, making these grandiose decisions about the fate of the universe. That's true. Well, remember, Green Lantern's going to be in there. I don't know. There's a lot of there's a lot of other like I think Marvel's got a little bit better covered as far as like like mixing it up with race, especially like if you look at Civil War, you've got Black Panther, you've got um, Falcon, mm -hmm. you know, and you've got War Machine, all three black guys. I mean, I think that's like a lot of people aren't even noticing that. Really, it's like they're really doing a good job of like well, I mean, kind it's of the sidekicks, but yeah. Well, you know. <laughs> Sidekicks or not, I, well, I Black think Black Panther's getting his own standalone film. Right, yeah. one of the biggest things right no, now. Is who's going to get to direct? I'm being, yeah. I'm being, I'm being facetious here. Definitely, I, I hear your points about about race, but let's talk about like for Jessica Jones, we had Luke Cage. Now he's a main character. What are your thoughts on Luke well, Cage? It's, it's actually not just Luke Cage. Like I, 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 that's one of the things I loved about Jessica Jones as a as a whole. Right, you have um, a show which basically stars women. Mm -hmm. Totally, yeah. and it's women centric. Right, all the leads. It made it feel fresh and original. Right? You can you can say what you want about production design and right. it, it, yeah, and I know that the, the show has detractors, right? But it was dope because it was different. It was different because it starred all women. And then you have Luke Cage, who is yeah, he's a black dude, but they're not like, hey, you're a black guy. Like right. the race wasn't brought into it. It was, he was just a guy. Yeah, and um, you know, and. I think you brought up a good point with, with Civil War being like, you know, uh, Black Panther is going to be a big part of, of the Marvel Universe right. going forward. Um, eventually, Falcon will become Captain America, mm. most likely. Uh, you know, um, the, the Avengers are slowly going to become or are, are becoming more international. I think that's super cool. Right. And I, and I just I hope. <sighs> look, as a comic book book fan, as, as a guy who got into this because I was alienated because I, I didn't have friends so like my friends were these characters um, it, it's just I don't know it's 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 nice to you, you end up having this like or at least I end up having this weird love hate relationship with with these movies because now mm. they are so mainstream mm -hmm. they are so like every kid knows who these characters are who you know when I was growing up you only knew who they were if you were a huge nerd right which Absolutely. which I was right um so yeah, now you know it's. Let's just say I'm not going to see Gods of Egypt. Let's just say I'm going to boycott <laughs> that movie because <laughs> because that's racist. That movie's just racist. Well, let's uh, let's talk about a film <laughs> like a, a brand new series that's coming out. Our next subject, which also is going to feature Luke Cage, it's called Iron Fist. So news finally spread. Netflix series moves forward with a showrunner and executive producer. They finally picked someone out. Everyone was doubting whether Iron Fist was actually even going to happen. But now it's officially a go with Marvel bringing on Scott Buck to be the showrunner and executive producer. Jeff Loeb says Scott's idea knocked Marvel off of their feet. Buck says, I've always been drawn to writing complex, intriguing characters, and that's what most excites me about the opportunity to bring Danny Rand and Iron Fist to life with Marvel on Netflix. Here's the official Marvel Netflix series description. Returning to New York after being missing for years, Daniel Rand fights against the criminal element corrupting New York City with his incredible kung fu mastery and ability to summon the awesome power of the fiery Iron Fist. <laughs> now I'm looking forward to seeing how they introduce Danny as well as his friendship with Luke Cage, if they were pals before Rand disappeared, and how all these characters actually become the defenders and what's going to bring them all together. This is all part of that, that Netflix series which does exist in the Marvel Universe but is kind of centric and is really I like it because with Daredevil and with with now with Jessica Jones, Luke Cage coming up next, Daredevil season two, and then Iron Fist and Punisher and Pun well Punisher being in Daredevil, yeah, yeah. it's um, it's really it's, exciting. it's basically like Marvel Max. Totally. Right? It's, like, it's like Netflix is now Marvel yeah. Max. Adi's talking about a, a comic book line called Marvel Max, where they were able to like push it a little bit, make it a little more adult, and they actually featured Punisher. I believe it was the Garth Ennis, like mm -hmm. a little harder-edged Punisher. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. And they had Luke Cage with Richard Corbin. Yeah, Heroes, Heroes for Hire. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I'm excited. I'm, a, I'm actually, speaking of race, I wonder if they're going to make Daniel Rand Asian or if they're going to make him white. What do you think? Look, start with you, John. I, I honestly have no idea. 
I have no idea what they're going to do, and I'm sure whatever they do, they'll have purpose. The, the part about this news that excites me, though, is the name Scott Buck. And for those of you who don't know, Scott Buck is like pr primarily he's been a television television producer for a while, but he's produced and been executive producer on shows like Six Feet Under, yep. and for me, most importantly, Dexter, because I freaking love Dexter, and I love that sort of stuff. And you take a guy with that sense, those types of sensibilities. What they did with Dexter, and you bring that, which I think we can all agree, after we've seen Daredevil and Jessica Jones, mm -hmm. that is the type of sense and tone and flavor you can bring into that Netflix world really easily. Definitely. I think this is a great match. I'm excited that he's producing it. So I, I now I, I went from being lukewarm about seeing an Iron Fist show to being... Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, now I'm on yeah. board. Now I yeah. want to see what they do. When I read this, so you're saying thing. you went from being lukewarm to Luke Cage. Bam! <laughs> oh. There he did it. All right, yeah, he well, went Yeah, there. Alan <laughs> Alan Ball's Six Feet Under, then you got Scott, Scott Buck, you know, yeah. pretty much second in command. Like, if you haven't seen Six Feet Under, incredible series. So I was very happy to hear this, too. What do you think? I, I think it's going to be an interesting tonal mashup, right? Because yeah. um, one of the interesting things about the Marvel Universe is you, you've got, you're, you're dealing with like technology, magic, um, gods. Mm -hmm. And we haven't really gotten into the, into the magic part. You know, we've, we've, we've dealt with technology with, with Iron Man. We've, um, and, and I guess the super, like the, the, the whole phase one was all tech technology based, even Captain America. You, you can argue that super soldier. It was theory. science. It was, it was science, science that made right? It. Technology, science. Um, and Thor was your window into the realm of gods, right? Right. Yeah. Your Not bridge. really magic. It's kind of like its own. What you call magic, we right. call science. Right. So yeah. they they're viewing it as science too. Yeah. Now you're dealing with like demons and shit with right. Doctor Strange and um, different dimensions. Right. So th I think that's going to be interesting tonally because I know if I were directing um, Iron Fist or, or show running it, I. My instinct would be to like make it um, more like Big Trouble in Little China, mm -hmm. make it more like a Carpenter movie, mm. you know, um, make it super retro, like '80s, like have the music be synth. Like, I would add VHS bars and grain the shit out of <laughs> the, you know, the right image. On. It would be slightly campy. Mm -hmm. You know what that sounds like? A guy that you've worked with before, Joe Carnahan, because he had that one Daredevil, uh, the yeah. Daredevil oh, yeah. project right. that did. they were going to do. That he was did, very yeah. much sounded like that, yeah. which would have been pretty damn. His cool. sizzle reel had that flavor to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it really did. Um, I, you know, I, I'm concerned a little bit about Iron Fist and the fiery brand of the Iron Fist, simply because of what you said, like the way that Marvel introduced Iron uh, Iron Man and the Hulk at the, in that same year. So you had technology, and you had this kind of like. Jekyll and Hyde beasty monster creature that we were so far used to just from the Ang Lee interpretation and the, you know, the Bill Bixby, uh, right. you know, the, the TV series. Um, the Hulk didn't really hit it too well either times. Uh, and then you have Iron Man was a big hit, Captain America, big hit, Thor, big hit. So I think it kind of meshed. And once they began phase two, it really sort of like opened up the, the, the you know, the cosmic realm, which we're all okay with now because it kind of was like a nice crawl towards that you know mm -hmm. what i like about daredevil and jessica jones even though jessica jones is about you know oh you're it's one of them you know super powered we've heard about them normal people are slightly afraid when they encounter a superhuman because it's freaky it's weird what are they gonna do they can fly their skin's invulnerable you don't know what they're about i think once you introduce this kind of uh magical element which is the fiery power of the iron fist I worry that it, it starts to get... That's why I don't want to see Daredevil or Punisher or Jessica Jones in Avengers. I don't want to see them in that movie world because I feel like where they are right now, it's grounded to the sense where it's like once they start to introduce too many of the weirder aspects, it, it might lose its its uh, its foothold that it has in reality. Like the Kingpin was a very scary and real villain. Granted... Kilgrave, he has the power of the voice to make you do what you want, but it's still somewhat grounded, not in reality, but grounded in the context of the of where we are pushing those boundaries. Right. You know, I, I don't want to see the boundaries pushed too far. Like, I'd like him to have, like, some kind of amazing martial arts skill, 
but at the same time, I don't want like some kind of amazing power. The you know the iron fist to like where he b- basically becomes Keanu from Matrix. Yes, <laughs> where he's like hitting the floor and all the bad guys are flying to the air. And yeah, then he's like in in CGI like kicking them all. And I don't think you need to worry about that because apparently Netflix doesn't have the budget for it. Right for these shows. They're yeah, it all went to House of Cards. Yeah, House of Cards. Right, all the money <laughs> went to House of Cards. Very expensive. <laughs> All right, let's move on no, to... Uh, uh, for the record, I think yeah. Netflix is great. Hey, oh, man. it is. We love Netflix. We love Netflix. Yes. Can't stop watching it, guys. Um, but I've already, I've already like offended <laughs> Sony and Warner Brothers. <laughs> no, this, they're actually wanna... calling you about, like, like, get that Adi guy. He's going to start making a film for us. For Netflix? Yeah, it's, it's actually happening right now. I have a show with Netflix. There you go, man. So you haven't offended anybody. Um, yet. Well, I don't want the show to get canceled. Right. <laughs> right. I guess he canceled the show. You heard him. All right. Minor mutations. We're moving on to minor mutations. It's something I like to talk about. Little little uh, nuggets of uh, news, and then we'll pick which one we want to talk about. Number one, we got Anthony Russo. We've already had him, but he's talking about it's complicated is what he said about the defenders appearing in Infinity War. We kind of broached that already. The number two, we got Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart concept art was shown by Warner Brothers at the Brazilian CCXP uh, convention just this last week. Uh, Number three, we've got second season trailer for Powers is released on the PlayStation Network. And number four, we've got Evangeline Lilly saying she wants Michelle Pfeiffer to play her mom in Ant-Man and the Wasp. What sticks out to you, John, in the news this week? Uh, well, I want Michelle Pfeiffer to be anything she wants, anytime, anywhere. <laughs> She's one of the most talented, sexy actresses we've ever had in the business. Yes. So that aside, the other one big thing to me is is what Anthony Russo is saying, what I've been saying for a long time. Don't expect big crossovers between the Netflix characters and the rest of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. They have, they'll, they'll continue to give vague references, like the guy who waves a flag instead of saying Captain America. They'll say the incident instead of saying, when the Chitauri attack, attacked New York City and the Avengers protected it, they, you're right. never going to hear them say that. Right. They're going to they're gonna maintain that distance. And I think what Russo said, but, but keep in mind, I mentioned this in Movie Talk as well. Russo also said that, hey, you know, we never thought we could do it with Spider-Man because of the different studio relationship. And that's happening, so nothing's impossible. So I believe it's not impossible, but I think it's really unlikely we're ever going to see these Netflix characters, like, say, pop up in Avengers Infinity War. Right. How about you, Adi? I was actually thinking that the whole time um, I was watching Jessica Jones. Because mm-hmm. I, could, I, could to- I could totally imagine Kilgrave showing up in Avengers. You know, <laughs> taking control of Iron Man or Captain America or sure. something like that. That could have been a uh, a trope. I, you know, I'm, I'm mixed on it. It, it really depends. Uh, Infinity War, absolutely not, because it's it's literally like they're dealing with like cosmic shit. Sure, there's already like 800 characters in it already. You really want to throw the Defenders in well, there? Yeah, not just that. I mean, like Thanos would just yeah. beat the shit out of them. Yeah. You know <laughs> what I mean? They'd eat them. Like, yeah. like literally, like, hey, you, uh, what's your power? That you're angry and you have a gun and you wear a skull. You're dead. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's just like that. It, it would, it would literally, you know, be like that. And that's actually why I like, you know, just going back to Spider-Man for a second. That's why I like Spider-Man being. I think Spider-Man works in today's in today's world. Spider-Man works much better as like a, as a tertiary character than mm. than the lead, mm-hmm. because Spider-Man, to me, works when he's the underdog. Right. Yep. Right. That's the the character. Peter Parker is the underdog, and, and and in the '70s it was like, oh, he he has to you know make it to school on time, or, <laughs> or 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 oh man, he can't pay rent, so he has to sell these photographs to J. Jonah Jameson or whatever it was. Um, it, in in today's world, you're like, I'm not buying that, but I do buy that in the context of this like young kid. Yeah, he's very powerful. Yeah, people like him, but he exists in a, in, a, in in this in this very complicated mul- uh, universe with this this plethora of characters who have these um, convoluted relationships with one another. Right? Right. It's, it's not like, hey, good, bad, good, bad. It's like, how would Captain America feel about Daredevil and the Punisher? Mm-hmm. And how they conduct business. Right. Yeah. You know, there, there's, there's some disagreement there. That's what I'd like to see, though. I'd like to see, like they did with the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I don't want to see these characters, like, like Daredevil or Jessica Jones, or even like I haven't seen Luke Cage or Iron Fist, they're just announcing it. But I'd like to see, like like you mentioned, I think that would be great to have Steve Rogers drop into one of the episodes of Daredevil. Yeah. That or be in the Defenders. That's cool with me. The I'm other with way, you. not I'm so. with you. I'm with yeah. you. Um and actually I'm I'm not interested in a Spider Man movie as much as I would be in a in, in Spider Man being in the Netflix universe of That would be great no? too. I mean I, the you know 
if if I had my druthers, I'd pick Cap, you know, to drop in because I think that would tie in better, just because of the even the far reaching of Sony, Marvel, and then Marvel's Netflix would be like, what's happening? So, well, I wouldn't you know. I wouldn't put Peter Parker in there. Yeah, right. Get a dip, Miles Morales. I would, yeah, I would do Miles. That I know that they're talking about introducing him, but I think what they want to do first is like. Here's Peter Parker. Let's get him settled, then roll off. I think mm-hmm. they had to re- reverse engineer everything after The Amazing Spider-Man 2 because they were already setting up, like, you know, they had the Sinister Six, they had a Venom movie, they had, like, Aunt May, they had all these, you know, they, they had a lot of things that aren't happening now. Yeah. But I don't think they've given up on all those They're ideas. like, you know, when we blow everyone's mind with this Amazing Spider-Man 2, <laughs> we have this whole universe that <laughs> we're going to create off of it. Yeah. It was a great idea. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it, still it was. Might work. I still you know, I was bought what, into the what trailers. I, what I don't understand, right, is your most uh, interesting Spider-Man character is not Peter Parker anymore. He's just not, right? He's more of like a relic relic of the past. Um, I always thought like Miguel O'Hara was Spider-Man 2099. Right was like way doper of a character especially in today's context like a cyberpunk spider-man mm. that's dope it's awesome they could always we were talking about batman beyond earlier today on movie mm-hmm. talk like they could if they wanted to try those kinds of characters out in the tv world i think why not do a batman beyond or a spider-man 2099 but i think they have you to know why because marvel unlike this is this is highlights again why d what dc is doing is smarter than what marvel is doing as far as their relationship between their television and their movie universes because dc has set it up that their television universe is completely a different thing from the movie universe dc could do that dc could do a batman beyond or if they could do anything they wanted. If they wanted to test out an idea, they could go to television and do it because they've already established yeah, they, they already nothing a, to do. They already do. have a Batman TV show. Right, Gotham. Well, just sort Batman. Of, yeah. No, no, Batman, no, no. Yeah. It's called Arrow. Yeah, but, yeah it's basically. <laughs> but see, but they can do that. It's like, I'm Bat- uh, Arrow. 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 And it doesn't, it doesn't interfere with the I have all Batman's mo- villains, though. <laughs> That's right. It doesn't interfere with the movies and it doesn't confuse it because we know these are two separate universes. Marvel has handcuffed themselves. Marvel can't just experiment on television because anything that happens on TV is supposed to be part of the cinematic right. universe as well. And therein lies why I think it's a lot smarter of a move for DC to do their television movie universes the way they do. I'm glad you brought that up. Hey, Dennis, let's let's hit hit us with that uh, Martian Manhunter picture. So, bam, Supergirl last night revealed that Martian Manhunter is actually the guy who's been in charge of that secret organization that's like with her sister. And I remember watching episode three, and his eyes started glowing red. And I did a Supergirl recap a couple weeks ago, and I was like, you know what? I bet you that guy's gonna be Martian. He's gonna be John Johns. Whoa, whoa, whoa! whoa. Martian Manhunters in in Supergirl. In Supergirl, yeah, yep. that's kind of dope. Them. I I'm thought that was dope. Up. I haven't watched that episode yet, but they they you know these spoiler kids that can't help but like throw that stuff on the internet. I'm like, <laughs> yo, spoiler man, kids. let me catch up and watch that, son. So that's what how I found out about. It. So I'm looking forward Did to you guys catching watch up. the Flash. John has been oh, watching the I Flash. I love the Flash. Yeah, I, thought, I love great. the Flash. Yeah, I think they yeah. do a great job. With I the have Flash. many episodes to catch up on. I finally finished Daredevil. People like Dennis just stop pounding me. It. I know. Me and Dennis are. Dennis lot. is already up to like episode fifteen or something. What? Yeah, he's ahead of me. Of of what? Flash on Flash, season one, right? See, all right. See, I, I can catch up. Which, by the way, make sure you tune in to your Declider video tonight for our Flash recap show. It's That's the mid-season right. finale tonight. Make sure you tune in for that. Mid-season finale. Is it, these are the crossovers between Arrow No, they did and those Flash. last week. How yeah. was that? that was I thought great. it was pretty dang good. So that Legends Vandal. of Tomorrow, right? Well, it, it, it wasn't Legends. It, they, 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 introduced Vandal, they introduced Vandal Savage. And okay. Hawkgirl and Hawkman. Yeah. And now, so you had a lot of hate going on with Legends of Tomorrow. Have you changed your mind a little bit now that you've seen Hawkman, Hawkgirl, and Vandal Savage? Nope. Still don't think it's going to work. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, we went into that last yeah. week. <laughs> well, I'll tell yeah. you off camera. Though. I mean, it's okay. the exiles, though, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, this. Let's move on to what I like to call flashback, where we talk about a movie that came out. It's a superhero film. This week, we're going to talk about Blade Two. That's right, 2002's Blade Two, the second installment, in what became the Wesley Snipes trilogy. Blade Two is directed by the amazing Guillermo del Toro, and as with anything made by this freakishly awesome monster lover he brought with him the concept of something even vampires fear horrible weird mutant vampire creatures that feed off humans and vampires <laughs> these diseased hybrids are tough enough for blade and his eventual allies to actually fight the second feature brings it with all that del toro tastiness uh, amazing designs a uh, great final fight and the freakish you know whatever i can't remember if they called reapers or what they were called where their face just I think they breaks were called open reapers or reavers reavers or, or whatever reavers is, uh, scary 
succubus monster things with the bizarre flower tongues, whatever yeah. they were, came out of Del Toro's freakish mind. So let's talk about Blade. Let's talk, John. Why don't you and start And don't forget, off? Hellboy was in that movie. Well, yeah, so right. Ron Perlman <laughs> Ron and Perlman? a whole group of other people. Yep. They were like the That's vampire ninja hunter. Vampires yeah, what's going on? They had I, I love Ron group. Perlman. Yeah, Ron oh Perlman God, yes. is the shit. He's yeah. so amazing in everything he's in. He's the nicest guy ever. He'd yeah. like, like hey, dude, how are you doing? No, well, hey, man, I, I secretly hope that they finally get Hellboy 3 done before I die and Ron yeah, Perlman is in it. That ain't going to happen. I, you know, I'm going to hold an arrow. wants $200 million. Dude has a bootleg, right? <laughs> you know, we're talking to the guy, the king of bootlegs right here. Man, let's make that happen, man. <laughs> yeah. Come on. This is one of those movies, like, though. Tell, tell Ron we're doing Dirty Laundry 2. <laughs> yeah. But when he shows up and you're like, yeah, no, no, but, you know, we're... we're um. Put this yeah, on. Right. Yeah, just you're gonna just have to wear this, this outfit. It's like why well, one more red? Wow. <laughs> This movie pro- is one of the movies that proves that sometimes sequels can be better than the originals. Definitely. And this was funny. It was fun. It was exciting. How they made Hellboy 2, or Hellboy, I'm sorry, how they made Blade 2 and then gave us the Blade 3 that they gave us, I have no idea. Mm. But Blade 2 was definitely a step up in the yeah. game from the first one. I love this movie. I love the villainous characters. I love that you had now something that was out there feeding on vampires. I like the whole mythology of it. I like those... Those flying and and at the time they tried something which today would be considered pedestrian, but at the time it was really pushing the edge of visual effects when they had a completely CGI blade yeah. running up the walls and fighting these other vampires that were invading his base of operations mm-hmm. stuff like that. It looked a little bit cheesy, but it was you got to remember it was pushing the edge of the envelope at right. the time. Some shots really worked though. I remember right yeah. from that trailer where they had that jumping shot where you saw him jump and then land. It was really well done and it was a CG blade. How about you? What do you think, Adi? I love I mean I love Blade as a character, right? Um And it's not just cuz, you know, He's not a white dude. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a joke. Um, no, I, lo- I love him as a character because he's because he's you know he's a vampire hunter, but who exists in this in this weird wacky universe of superheroes. Right. right? I always loved that. I, I loved when he popped up in the Spider Man cartoons or the X Men cartoons, um, and especially Blade Two. I wouldn't. I would argue that it's it's not necessarily that they improved on the on the first movie, but it was just different. It was it was a different. You know, it, it was it was the same actor playing a, a different version of the character. Mm. Right. Right. The, yeah. the first movie was like this this gothic noir movie. Right. Kind of similar tonally to The Crow. Yeah. With um, a techno soundtrack, and love um, that blood rave. Yeah. And the, and the second movie just was was faster. It was it was it was faster. The um. It felt more action adventure, mm-hmm. whereas the first one felt more like closer to a horror film. Definitely. No, I'm glad you brought that up. There were definitely d- tonal differences in both films. It felt like a successor to the first film, but went in a totally different direction. Mm-hmm. And, and that's refreshing when you're basically talking about, here's the story of this character. He's a vampire, and he's a daywalker, and he's fighting these vampires. Where do we go from here after we just had this insane first movie where you know you have the lord of vampires all these vampire cg bats remember the ending with fighting a blood monster or whatever dorf turned into i can't remember but yeah. sword fighting and all this madness deacon frost yeah, was deacon name frost yeah. that's right yeah. so i yeah i specifically really enjoyed blade 2 as a really great sequel which is like you know you got spider-man 2 you got blade 2 you got Dark Knight. You, a lot of these superhero films really hit it out of the park in their second incarnation. Yeah, and, and that makes sense to me. Um, you know, um, I feel like especially early on there was this there was this over reliance on telling that same coming of age story. Mm. Right. You know, um, right. a lot of these superheroes and end up being these reluctant heroes where they're like they either get their powers and they're like, oh man, I don't know if I can do this. Why me? They they they're, right. they spend the whole the first movie being like, why me? Yeah. Right. Or trying to understand the extent of their, their their powers, and then in the second movie they've achieved self self actualization, right? And now they're actually having to battle their doppelganger, right? right. Yeah, right? No, that's um, true. Even with X two, I mean X Men, it was Wolverine. Do I join this group? What am I doing? And then what? And the the good thing about also with sequels where you're taking like you've already set the origin, you've got the audiences into the these characters. With the second film, you can go anywhere, and you've way, got your audience. I, I'd, with ar- you. I'd argue one of the things that worked about Jessica Jones, one of the many things that worked, is it felt like a sequel. Because mm. they kept referencing this whole movie that you never saw, right? And it made sense. No, that's true. Because yeah. you know, because that's cause a good point. Yeah, right. Um, 
Daredevil fell into the trap, which, but the thing is they executed it perfectly, mm -hmm. but it fell into the trap of the origin story. Mm -hmm. Worked perfectly, right? Um, it's very true. That you're, that's a good, a good observation, Jessica Jones. Even though they were like doing the flashback scenes, they did it in the right way. You know what else is interesting? Um, between, you know, because you were talking about Marvel versus DC, the right. TV versus movies. And, and I think I, I went off on this kind of like, I, 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 I joke a lot about race, you know, because, mm -hmm. um, but I got kind of upset when I was talking about Batman versus Superman. And I guess you guys kind of picked up on that. Mm -hmm. um, here's why um, the Marvel Universe is about ordinary people who get godlike powers. And it's usually, and, and they become heroes because of something that they did, right? right. Spider Man didn't stop the burglar. Right. Kills Uncle, Uncle ben, ben, he becomes Spider Man, realizes that with great power comes great responsibility. Right. Right. Um, um, these are, you know, Iron Man builds a suit of armor. The, these, these people, they're, they're, they're having to make these life or death decisions and they're playing God and they, they acknowledge this, right? The DC universe is about gods pretending to be ordinary men. Right. Mm, that's, right? I have never thought of it that way. Um, in fact, you take Batman. And you throw him in the Marvel Universe, all of a sudden he's he's like the least interesting character ever. He's only cool because he he's like this badass normal dude. He's the only human that hangs with gods. Right. Um that's why I kind of get kind of irritated <laughs> with the DC universe. Because it's it's literally like you're making this analogy with gods, you know, like like Aquaman, uh right. Wonder Woman, Superman. They're all they're literally gods. Right. They're 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 gods, they're rulers, they're kings, they're all of the above. I agree with you. I've made that analogy on Heroes before, where it's the DC universe is the Greek pantheon. Yeah, you totally. Know? And that's what they've been drawing from. And Marvel was kind of that upstart that was like, no, we're based in New York. You can have your metropolis. We're real. So that was what always differentiated me as a kid when I was reading uh, DC comics and Marvel comics. I was never like, I'm a Marvel zombie. I never picked a side. I liked both of them, but they definitely came at their story structures from that representation. Mm -hmm. And I think the the ones that I identified more with were the freaks and the mutants and the monsters, which was Marvel. All of it's derivated from mutation. Fantastic Four. They got they turned into monsters. I'm a I'm a guy who's on fire. They're I'm all outcasts. They were all outcasts. Totally. Right? Because because like literally one of like my favorite image is a Spider-Man kind of saving the day and people throwing trash at him. <laughs> it's it's, it's <laughs> the X-Men, you know, show up and people are like, you know, Ooh, boo, yeah. and they're holding signs mutants, and like, mutants, yeah. stay, you know, mutants go. Um, when Superman shows up, they're like, oh my God, he's here to save us. Right, which I actually like that with uh, Superman v. Batman, um, that the, Batman v. Superman, whichever order, um, that they're actually anti-Superman in this movie. They're like, look at the the freakish or alien that's statue yeah. with like false god. Yeah, so I like that they're bringing the... that in because I think that would be really what would Absolutely. happen. Absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, but, it it would literally like eradicate a lot of our social norms. The existence of a being like Superman would eradicate a lot of our social totally. norms. Yeah, and it would also recalibrate uh, a lot of our institutions that exist. Most definitely, yeah. most because they, they they would literally would. have to go back and rethink their ideology and what they're what they're preaching because there's a guy who can fly yeah it's, it's kind of like yeah. having kobe bryant on your basketball team like you you got to plan for him you got to like <laughs> you know change your change your strategy definitely all right well let's move on to uh this week's spotlight and we've got ronin by frank miller this week's spotlight is one of the first dc serialized graphic novels ever made it was written and drawn by frank miller who's playing with ninjas in his run on daredevil and went into the deep sci-fi fantasy which is ronin it introduced us to a dark dystopian world of the future with the main character billy an armless legless savant who dreams of being a ronin from the past billy has special powers and indeed manifests not only this Ronin character, but also a horrifying demon. I believe the character's name was Agat, and brings his heavy metal sex fueled fantasies into the futuristic reality with horrifying results. Let's talk Ronin and what would work best with this series, as so far as yet not been turned into a movie or TV show. They've been talking about it for as a movie for years. Nothing's happened. How about you? Start with you, Adi. Ronin. Uh, in terms of either a movie or a TV show, you see this, it this graphic either? novel. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Dude, I I think all of Frank Miller's stuff um well it definitely works better now cuz mm -hmm. you know like 
he's just been ripped off so much. Mm. But in the mainstream, right? Right. Right. Because like both him and Alan Moore were like these weird, dark, super indie dudes. Right. They, they were quite kind of like um, Steven so- Soderbergh and, and Quentin Tarantino. Yeah. Good right? analogy. Yeah. Um, who are now two of the most mainstream filmmakers out there who still get to maintain their original voices. Yeah, and they still get to make original, unique films. Right. Um, when they can. So. Yeah. So I, I... Let me put it this way. I think if Ronan were written by someone not named Frank Miller, it would be a harder sell. Mm-hmm. Mm. I, look, I'd be down for it completely um, with the one giant giant asterisk put beside it. Don't let Frank Miller anywhere near it. Like, that that was my thing. We saw what happened. Look, we saw what happened when he played pretend director on Sin City uh, with Rod Rodriguez, right? And he got, to, he got to call himself a director and hang out with the real director. That was fine. But then we saw what happened when he tried to ride the bike without the training wheels and do the spirit. And that was one of the most colossal messes I've ever seen. I think anything Frank Miller has written can be cinematic because he writes in a cinematic style. Mm-hmm. You know, all you have to do is read his stuff, and you can you can do like the way um, the way uh, Kevin Smith uh, describes uh, John Peters. You know, as you're reading Frank Miller, you can almost lay back and do this, <laughs> right. and you can totally yeah. see it that way, right? It's very true. Yeah. Just don't let him anywhere near it. Like, option it, get it from him, pay the right. man, but then just don't let him near the movie. I will argue, like, don't let the Frank Miller that's alive now. If we had a time machine and we could go back before he wrote RoboCop 2, if we can go back to right at this point when he was doing Ronin and Dark Knight and Martha Washington and just all of the incredible works that he powered through in like a seven to eight year span. Yeah. I think that would be the Frank Miller that you'd want to tap if I mean, you even needed to tap him. But. It's something I, I, I mean, just to be perfectly frank, it's something that I, as a creator, I'm super insecure about, about this because mm-hmm. I... All, all the people I, I respect and have idolized and stuff, you see them kind of deteriorate. You mm-hmm. know, they, they'll create something dope, and then over the years, um, they kind of lose touch with whatever that that impulse was that made that that right. thing. Right, right. They write Holy Terror, um, right. which came out a few years ago. So <laughs> or it's like, like you know, there's the Jar Jar Binks thing or what, what, right. whatever. Um, yeah, I know. I'm pers- I'm personally just very like that. What what you just said, right? Spot on. Made me cringe on the inside though, because I'm right. like, because I because I because I, I know at some point, um, I'm gonna lose touch. I'm, I'm and and that's not to say that I even am in touch right now. Right. But um, yeah, it, it's something I'm I'm, I'm kind of afraid of, um, you know, just the, this 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 whole idea that every year I get older. Right. Yeah. Well, they're, they're, they're let t- me tell 20. you, as an older man, don't fear that. Don't fear <laughs> growing older. Don't fear any of your anything you do. You're just going to learn from. So it's really? like I'm pretty sure Frank Miller. He's like, hey, I had so much fun helping Brian Azzarello write Dark Knight Three that I want to write Dark Knight Four. He's already announced it even before they finished doing the Dark Knight Three run. So look, I th- I love Frank Miller. I've you know I have everything he's ever written, and out of the misses. And you put all those hits together. It's a very small patch of misses as far as his work as an incredible writer, artist in the comic book world. D- definitely granted his step into the cinematic world working with Robert Rodriguez was great with Sin City. Didn't work so much so with his approach to the spirit and or even the Sin City 2. It just didn't work. And that was with Robert Rodriguez again. It just it felt tired as while the first Sin City felt so vibrant. So I think it's just how you approach certain materials. I think Ronin is ripe to be done as a miniseries or as a movie. It's a fantastic, really fun and original take on so many different heavy metal type of science fiction stories that all of us have read time and time again. And just taking that graphic visual approach, if you were able to get that in the film, that would be the most important thing to me. The story is not the super most original story. I still think it's really good the way they brought this character's like disabilities and with his powers, like these crazy psionic powers in this really weird, horrible, futuristic world. I'd like to see this this story done with this visual flair that someone out there can capture the look of Frank Miller without you know, what's, actually what's, what's having also to ape interesting it. Is you don't you don't get a lot of dystopian cinema, right? Anymore? Not on no, not the rare. way we used to. Like yeah. we used to get it like at least three a year. You'd have like three or four different versions of a Blade Runner or something. Yeah, it'd be I mean, like yeah. really grungy. Yeah, it'd be like we, really grungy. 
Um, it, it, they would basically draw on whatever the fears of, you know, it would be like, oh, and so today it would be like, oh, Donald Trump's become president of the universe. Yeah. Like, or, or, Ten years in the future. Yeah. yeah. Like, That's like true. that kind of thing. Like, um, you know, where did that where did that go? Because sci fi is just so clean now. I guess maybe it's just so mainstream. I think there's mm. a there's a return to dystopian futuristic science fiction. We're going to be seeing it. I, th- I think we saw the it get edged out with Tomorrowland was where I think that just is like mm. it's not working. It's not like we want to see a dystopian future and like let's make that happen. But it's it's tantalizing, especially with where the world is right now. There's these futures that we've seen already predicted maybe 30 years ago with Blade Runner, right. and you look at the world now. Granted, we don't have flying cars, but everything else is almost the same. So it's like you sort of see these things like predictions of the future that fall way off the, you know, escape from New York. Obviously, Manhattan isn't surrounded in 1997 as a prison, but there's all these other like things that the dystopian futures have predicted. So it's always fun as a film, as a film goer and a science fiction fan to see those kinds of magnifications and extrapolations in science fiction. So Ronan's perfect to, to, to make that right now. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to Twitter questions, guys. We got Chris Day, and this question is for our guest, Adi. Question is, will we ever get a Dread 2? So me and John Campia. Wasting no time. We are, yeah, we, we are big fans of Dread. Love that film. I, saw, I got the chance to see it in 3D. I hope you guys, if you did get to see it in 3D, one of the best uses of 3D. I always think 3D is like, ah, why am I going to see this in 3D? Did they really do anything to make it special? This had that crazy drug. I can't remember what it was called. Slow-mo. This is called Slow Mo. Um, I was like, yeah, wasn't it called something like Nuke? I'm like, good, still stuck on Frank on Miller, <laughs> you know, and stuff. Yeah, Slow Mo. Great cinematic you usage. You got any Nuke, kid? Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about Dread 2. What's the possibility of that happening? Well, don't get in trouble. This I know time. that's that's yeah. what I'm, I'm saying. Say what like... you can say if there's something to say. <sighs> I beat it out with a sequel. Could be. <laughs> but that's where we are right now. So there's there are possibilities of a dread too, is what you're saying. It's not. It's not a done deal. It's not a dead horse. Um, if I'm alive, it's not a dead horse. All right. I mean, Let's keep this man way. alive. I mean, like, because <laughs> it's it's like, you know, I, I I was I was pretty much like a little kid when dread when the first dread happened, right? Mm-hmm. Um. So I mean, I I just I, I don't give up, you know. Like e- even even if it doesn't happen in this cycle of entertainment fine but at some point movie theaters are going to go the way of the you know opera houses sure at some point netflix isn't going to be the only streaming service known to man right um at some point the world is just going to change and technology is going to change and entertainment's going to evolve and i just don't give up you know i i it, The problem is every time I talk about it, it becomes this like news thing and it'll end up on Reddit and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then I feel this weird amount of pressure and I feel like, oh man, I I, I failed. I somehow failed. Well, um, we're not putting that pressure on you. All right, news flash, Adi Shankar is developing Dread 2. It's happening. So <laughs> let's move on. Let's go. We're gonna go to Robert Johnson. Next question. Where do you think Batman was when Zod broadcasted to the world that he was ready to kill everyone on the planet? It's just a hypothetical guess. Bruce Wayne was actually active, hanging out in Gotham. What was he doing? He was he was in Gotham. Like, like a lot of people tend to forget when watching Man of Steel how quickly all the events happened. Like, it's not like Zod showed up on Earth and then three months pass and then Zod and Superman had their battle. It was like he showed up five hours later. This happens. Twelve hours later, this happens. End of movie. Like it, would, it all happened really, really quick. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, where was Bruce Wayne? He's probably at Wayne Manor. 
probably sleeping with three chicks and right. and uh, polishing up the old bat suit and stuff like that. And he wouldn't have even been able to got to Metropolis in time to do anything about it. So I just think people underestimate. I mean, it's not like it all happened in the span of five minutes, but it was a very short window of time that the entire movie actually takes place in. Right. I mean, Superman was still doing the greatest American hero, like falling and learning yeah, how, to fly. To how to fly. By the time Zod showed up, was like, give us Kal-El. You're like, he didn't even get to be Superman. He didn't save one cat. <laughs> Everyone's always like arguing about like he destroyed Metropolis. He didn't get to do anything yet. He just got the this is a weird outfit. You're under arrest. You know what I mean? Yep. He didn't get to do anything. Yep. How about you? What do you think? This is what Batman what was, was doing? Bruce yeah. Wayne doing when Zod made his announcement? When when, uh, when Zod said, "We are here. You are yeah. not alone." <laughs> you just cracked me up because I was I was just imagining like the Superman video game, like the video game version where right. it's like, "Congratulations, you have your suit. Engage." <laughs> Final boss battle. And you're like, what? I mean, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> and you know, but they haven't like taught you the controls yeah. yet. You that's know, pretty you know. much the movie. Hit yep. A A plus B. I know. I don't know. He's punching me in the face. So, Bruce Wayne, what do you think he was doing? It's a hypothetical. Pull ups. Probably. Right yeah. Yep. It's like, who's this guy? Zod. He didn't even say his name, did he? <laughs> All right. Next question comes from Guy T A C Dagnize. And he asks specifically for Adi, D plus I plus S helped make movie put movies in perspective for me. Does the popularity of comic book movies help sell ideas internationally? So when um thanks for that question. Um D plus I plus S, do you guys know what that is? No, I don't. So um, it's actually the formula through which movies are financed, right? So D is the domestic value, domestic being America. I is the international value. And S is the subsidy, so that's the government rebate. And right. if you combine the value of those three things, if it is is greater than the cost of making the movie, your movie's going to get made. It doesn't matter how shitty your movie is. Right. It's actually as, as rudimentary as that, right? Okay. So, um, yes, actually, the popularity of comic books does change the formula because, um, you know, um, what determines D and I is um, basically, you know, the, the, the antiquated idea of movie stars, right? So if you had Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt, the same script with those two guys was worth exponentially more than uh, the same script with... Paul Giamatti. Paul Giamatti, hmm. which is all worth, you know. Which we all agree he needs a standalone Rhino movie, right? Totally. <laughs> like, we're in total agreement <laughs> on that. Okay. Um, but the the um, the way to game that formula, not game it, because, you know, gaming sounds like a, like a cheat code, but uh, intellectual property has supplanted the whole notion of... Um, the, the, like, well, it's, it's supplanted the need for uh, a movie star, right? So... Um, Stephanie Meyer offered me the rights to the host. You know, it was her big follow-up to Twilight years right. ago. Um, this is a really funny story. Um, I was on the set of Killing Them Softly. I was I was getting ready to leave. Great movie, by the right? way. Right. Thanks. Um, I was saying bye to Andrew Dominic. I was like, he's like, Eddie, you going? Where are you going? I'm like, oh, back to L.A. So then I went <laughs> to say bye to Brad Pitt. And he's smoking a cigarette. And. Uh, and he's like, yes, yeah, so what's next? And I started talking about the host, and he's like, oh, what's that? And it's like, Stephanie Myers of Twilight. And he gives me this look. Like, <laughs> it's clearly like he's late losing respect for me. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I kind of freaked out, and I, and I realized, like, oh, my God, I'm selling out. I need to not do that. But um, point being, uh, the, the host, which I was not involved in, um, sold out, you know, every, without a script, without a director, without an actor, sold out in every territory, you know, every American distributor was fighting for the distribution rights to it because they were like, hey, this is the fall of the Twilight. This thing could be like the next big thing. Right. We can't miss out on it, right? And so, yeah, you know, it's the popularity of comic books, but I think also distributors have, have, have um, wisened up, so to speak, mm -hmm. because it's, it's not necessarily that every comic book is a is a is a huge hit, uh, or has a loyal fan base, so to speak, right? Um, that makes sense. Well, thanks for explaining. Did that, did that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it did. no, it very does. well explained. Right. So, like, so, like, you know, if if you and I, if the three of us had the rights to the crow right now, right, um, we could show up to to Cannes or Berlin or you know any any film market, mm. and it would sell out like that. 
because they'd be like, oh, Crow, you know, it's comic books. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's an R-rated movie, which they they hate, but it's. What if we it's attach known... Edward Furlong to wait? That's you know, <laughs> oh, he was already oh. the crow. You know, that was a crow four, right? Uh, <laughs> Reboot. Wicked, it was called like Wicked Wicked Prayer or something. <laughs> yes, it is. It's on Netflix right now. I, I passed it by is? it. Yeah, I was like, I may, maybe I'll watch a crow. Maybe not. All right, let's move on. Thanks for answering that. Uh, Next question is Rat Nadeep Das asks, do you guys think WB have taken the right decision to not merge the TV and films unlike Marvel? I think we covered that yeah, already. Yes, so. the absolutely is 100% yeah. undoubtedly, unequivocally, yes, they made the right move. I will also agree that I'm I'm happy to see that WB. Originally, I was like kind of like, huh, well, you know, let's see how it all pans out. And it's really fun because now we're getting to see the experimentation with like having John Johns show up on Supergirl yep. and not having to worry about, well, are, we have the rights for Justice League. Would you cast me as Nightwing? I would cast you. Let me think here. If I could be convinced to have a Nightwing in a story, yes. Yes, I would. Because this could be like a new insult, right? Being like, be like, you're totally um, Batman. Right. But the TV version. <laughs> but the, t- the, but TV the TV version. version. <laughs> I see you as Grayson, uh, Nightwing, but Robin from an alternate universe you're CW really, half hour you're really comedy good show. Looking guy yeah. right. for radio. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> but radio, you don't see the. Oh. Yeah. It's like you're a little too. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever they could say to us. Yeah. All right, next next question. We got Gonz- to like cut you down with false compliments. <laughs> We've got Gonzalo Torres C asks, "Hey, how Batman? How can Batman have a nightmare about parademons if he doesn't know anything about Darkseed?" Well, you're just. I'll answer this really quickly. You're presuming that those floaty, weird, fly-like creatures are parademons. I know Kevin Smith recently said. I thought in the background I saw a boom tube. I was like, "What? What?" So I don't know, is Batman, is this nightmare that he's having about the future Superman, is this some kind of vision that he's having via through maybe Wonder Woman's magic lasso? We don't know why he's having this nightmare, and is it a foreshadowing of Darkseid, or is it just weird floaty gnat creatures that happen to be in the thing, and it was like, it's just we're all saying they're parademons, just like we're saying, oh, that's not Doomsday, that's a wraith. We don't know. It could be just Doomsday, and that's the design, and that's it. So what do you guys think? Is that you saw the trailer? Yeah, those floaty I, creatures. I thought. Go ahead. I don't. I, I didn't know what the floaty creatures were, yeah. but I, I assumed that was Doomsday. It could very well be Doomsday. Yeah. I mean, but look, whether or these Fish are Man. like uh, Dark Side's uh, parademons, look, it's it's likely that he's just having. Remember, we don't know this for sure. We're speculating, just like you're speculating. So take it for what it's worth. But I think those. Since it's a nightmare, I think he's just having radical images. And just because we look at those and say, "Hey, those could be parademons," you know, understanding that. Maybe Dark Side's going to come along at some point, maybe. But that's speculation now, bait, uh, building on speculation, building on speculation. Now you're getting like three levels of speculation deep. It's like Inception, for heaven's sake. <laughs> so I think it's just a nightmare. He's going to see some goofy things in his yeah. nightmares, and I don't really ascribe any kind of meaning to it. I don't think he's having visions of the future. Like Batman does not have the power of foresight. I was, I'm bummed, though, because I was really excited when, like, just as a comic book nerd, I was like, oh, Batman's got a different outfit. It's like that desert camo Batman. Now it's all a, it's all a dream. So none of it's real. I, I mean, who knows? I know. We, who we knows? Know. I'm assuming it's a dream, but it might not be. It's possible. All right. Let's, we got the next question. It comes from a person from the past. Evil Abraham Lincoln asks, do you guys think the Joker will appear in Batman versus Superman? No. I think there'll be references. We already saw in the trailer. I did love that one reference. when in the, in the last trailer, when Bruce Wayne is talking to Clark Kent, he says, call it the Gotham guy and me, but we're a little... Nervous, we're a little hesitant about uh, psychopaths dressing up like clowns. Is it freaks that dress freaks up dressing like up like clowns, yeah. and then the little stare off with us. I love that yeah. moment. So I think you're going to hear references to Joker, uh, maybe even some very direct references. But I don't think we're going to see Jared Leto pop up in this film, even as a cameo. If it if they did, if he does, then this will be the only thing that Warner Brothers has been able to keep under wraps, right? Because they couldn't keep. You know, Ben Affleck on the set of uh, Suicide Squad right. under wraps. That got leaked out all over the place. So I think there'll be references. I don't think we're going to see him. How about you? No. Because um, I think the stakes are just too big for this movie, right? Oh, agreed. Yeah, right. that's a, yeah absolutely. And we're in, getting introduced to this new Joker like six months later in Suicide Squad. So, And Batman's going to be in that. So. Yes, he is. If anything, there might be, I would, ga- I would guess, there might be some imagery 
of the Joker in Batman's Batcave. That would yeah. be my guess. He could be on a monitor or there could be a clue or some kind of something. Because already we actually we've seen the Joker in Batman v Superman. Look at Robin or Nightwing's outfit with ha ha ha. Look at what you've done. You know, we already the Joker's already kind of Jokes on you. a character yeah. in in the movie without ever seeing him. Physically, he has so, a presence in the yeah, film, even though he's not there. physically there. Yeah, so yeah. I wonder. I mean, I I don't know. They might, they might not. But if they did, it would be. I don't think he would actually have a speaking role. I love how Star Wars is taking like the, the the DC approach. How so? Well, they're they're starting with like the big thing, mm-hmm. right? And yes, then yes. doing the little spinoffs, yeah. right? Versus Marvel's like piece, 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 piece big right. thing, big thing, yeah. right? It's like it's like. It's a lot like the comic books. It's like, hey, uh, here's a Thor issue. Here's a Captain America issue. Here's a Batman issue. And oh, here's this big event. Right. Um, yeah. All right. Well, here is our last question is the sweaty question of the week, and it comes from Brenton Kelly. Thank you, Brenton, for sending in so many different questions. I had to only pick one this week. Why is Marvel getting rid of X-Men in the comics, even though it doesn't affect Fox at all in the long run? So in the comic books. Well, that's easy. Yeah, what is it, Adi? Well, you know, like, it, it's kind of one of the problems, you know, as, uh, it would just suck. It, it, would, uh, it would just suck to be a comic book creator today, working for one of the, you know, one of the big two, mm. because you're effectively, you know, we were talking about, hey, try out Batman Beyond, try out this. Right. Well, they are being tried out. They're being tried out on the comic book, right. comic books, right? right. Like, um, Brian Michael Bendis is as much of the architect of the Marvel Cinematic Universe as Joss Whedon or Kevin mm-hmm. Feige or, or, or you know, whomever. Um, yeah. Frank Miller was as much of the architect of the Nolan Batman movies as, you know, Christopher or, or, uh, or Jonathan Nolan, but these guys aren't going to get the credit. So... To answer your question, man, my opinion, the comic books are kind of the the, the breeding ground for these stories, mm-hmm. right? It's not it's not so much eliminating the X Men to spite spite Fox, but if you have a cool concept, a cool idea, a cool interaction, might as well build it around some characters that you can then introduce in the movies. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think I mean we see that Marvel is doing that is reverse engineering. What comics used to come up with ideas and then spawn movies, now the movies are kind of reverse engineering. So when somebody who's like, I like Civil War and they go into a comic book shop, here's a brand new issue of Civil War. They're trying to get the non comic book reader to try out comic books by reverse engineering it. Yeah, I mean, look, I've said for a long time this won't affect whatever you do with the comic book. It's not going to affect what what's happening in the moving business at all. So if you're Marvel, why then put time, energy, and effort into something that ultimately could just theoretically benefit the other guy? And you're absolutely right. If you're going to come up with great story hooks and great ideas and great concepts and great narrative flows, why would you put them then into a comic book that could benefit Fox or another studio when you can just take those things and put them in the characters that you do have the movie rights for that you could leverage later on. Ultimately, I don't think it's going to affect Fox at all, but if you're Marvel, why not put your creative energies towards something that can benefit you? And, and, you know, the X-Men historically have been such a big part, I mean, like, as a kid of the 90s, right? I didn't give a shit about the Avengers. Mm -hmm. I thought Iron Man sucked, Captain America sucked. I just thought they were all whack. I only cared about the X-Men because of that cartoon, mm-hmm. right? Um, they were they were renegades, they were rebels, they were disenfranchised, kind of how I felt slash at times continue to feel. Um, they're such a loud voice within the Marvel Universe that you can't just kind of have them in the background. <laughs> they're not like the Fantastic Four who you can have in the background, you can show the Baxter building, and mm-hmm. you're like, oh, okay, cool. Like, they have their own agenda. They have their own viewpoint. You know, you, you, can't, you can't have, like, a, a, a seismic event and, and not get... and not somehow um, involve the X-Men in it because they, they're, they're not just a superhero team. They, they, are, they represent... Um, they're, they're a peacekeeping task force. They're a whole other race... Mm-hmm. They are. Um, they're a family. Yeah, they're a, they're a family. Um, they have their own. They are, they have their own political agenda. They have their own internal politics. Yeah. Mm. Um, 
I think, yeah, it's a, it's just sad if that's actually what's happening. As a kid of the 80s, the X-Men were also highly impactful for me. They were like my favorite comic book coming out when Chris Claremont and John Byrne were, were doing it. Oh, my it, gosh, it. that Claremont run was so dope. Yeah, I mean, Claremont wrote he, it well, for he, like nine I think, years. Well, I, I think, think. What, what happened is Claremont finally cracked. Um, it's weird to me that Stan Lee gets all this credit for X-Men because I, I thought Stan Lee's run on X-Men was like garbage. I wouldn't say garbage, but it, it was, was like a, it's of a time. Lame, of, like you know, there's like time. a putty putty guy called you know Ice Man, and it was it was whatever. But like, I think Claremont gets there. It starts with Evil Islands and stuff, and eventually you 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 know he's writing it, writing it, writing it, writing it. The this this new team dynamic gets built, mm-hmm. and then you then you end up with Days of Future Past, which is finally when it clicked. Like, oh, okay. This is this is a book, call it superheroes or whatever you want, but this is a book for people who love sci-fi. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's sci-fi meets meets uh, race relations, mm-hmm. right? And that's what was so cool about the X-Men. It was like they were they were they were dealing with multiple timelines, parallel universes, um, seismic events that could, you know, shatter reality. Um, and they still are with X-Men Apocalypse. I mean, mm-hmm. it's like I think the movies have taken the, some of the best storylines from those comics from the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and even now and done that kind of fusion. So I don't think that Marvel is going to phase out, so to speak, that the, the mutants. I think they're going to lower the profile because that's what they want to do because of the rights issues. It's unfortunate, but that's what's happening. So, you know, if that happens for the next five, six years, maybe that'll happen. Maybe it won't. We don't know just right now. So. All right. All right. Well, so welcome to a very long episode of Heroes, but I'm very happy we had a lot of really good discussions. I'd like to thank our guest, Adi Shankar. Where can people find you online, Adi? Uh, YouTube. Um, my, my YouTube page. Do you have a Twitter handle that you want to hand- throw yeah, out? Yeah. Uh, my name, Adi Shankar, brand, B-R-A-N-D. Right on. And John Campia, where can people find you online? Uh, Monday through Friday here for Movie Talk. Tuesdays, of course, on Heroes. Thursdays on Jedi Council. Saturdays and Sundays on Mailbag. Tuesday nights on the Flash Recap Show. And uh, Wednesdays on the Star Wars Rebels Recap Show. And, of course, look for my new book coming out now near the end of January. We pushed it back just so everybody knows. My new novel, The Pride, comes out near the end of January. And you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter at John Campia. Excellent. And you can follow me uh, just at Twitter, uh, on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. And get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, by going to www.tdoslh.com. What a tongue twister that is. Uh, You can get the digital download, buy it for a friend for the holiday season, support independent film. This has been episode 36 of Collider Heroes. I'll see you guys next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.